Hi again, this is Roy with another video lecture for this time for chapter number nine, where we are going to cover current liabilities. And here's a definition. Current liabilities are amounts we owe that we expect to pay either within one year's time or within one operating cycle, whichever is longer. And typically one year is longer. So if you owe amounts and has to be paid within a year's time, we would classify that as current. And if it's owed and has to be paid beyond a year's time, that's considered to be long term. Now if you don't remember what an operating cycle is, it's the time it takes, let's say you have, um, you have inventory that you plan to sell. So here's inventory sitting in your store or sitting in your warehouse. And then hopefully you can sell it soon. So now let's say you sell it on account. So now you're waiting on your customer to collect an accounts receivable and you're waiting and waiting and here's the money coming in slowly cash so now you can pay off your bills and buy more inventory that you plan to sell to customers on account and you're waiting to collect the money so now you can pay off your bill so going once around these steps is considered to be one operating cycle and hopefully this is rather fast maybe a couple months or three months and definitely one year is longer so we look at that longer period of one year and again anything that's old that has to be paid within a year's time is considered to be current classification and anything that's old and paid beyond a year's time is considered to be long term now keeping in mind that liabilities is just one type of account so if you remember we have assets liabilities equity, revenue, and expenses. And these three here, well, let's go to a white screen. White screen. Assets is everything we own, like that cash we saw a few chapters ago, or accounts receivable, the next best thing to cash, or remember inventory, merchandise inventory, all of these are considered to be current assets because they can either be converted into cash or used up rather quickly again within one year and assets that last you longer than a year are considered to be for example that property plan and equipment building uh, land so-called fixed assets all down here okay not current but long term and assets, remember, are on one side of our balance sheet or accounting equation. On the other side is the topic we're covering now, liabilities, that are classified or categorized either into current, things that have to be paid off within a year, or long-term liabilities, paid beyond a year's time. So what we kind of do is kind of match up these two here. Because current liabilities that have to be paid off soon are going to be paid off with your current assets either cash or things that can be converted into cash rather quickly okay so here's our chapter 9 our next chapter is going to be chapter 10 covering long-term liabilities and the finishing off of this accounting equation remember the equity this is our chapter 11 so all of these are sections on our balance sheet yeah these are sections on our balance sheet and besides balance sheet and income statement we've been seeing for the past few chapters the last financial statement remember we briefly mentioned this called cash flow statement or statement of cash flow that's going to be our chapter 12 our last chapter of the semester so here we are right now chapter 9 covering current liabilities that's part of the county equation or balance sheet So some names for liability accounts. We've seen accounts payable before. This is the, probably the most common uh, account name for a liability. Most liabilities end with the word payable. Yeah, payable, payable. Or well, here's one we saw before, back probably in chapter three, when we receive money in advance and haven't done the work yet, we haven't earned that money. So we put that uh, amount in an account called unearned revenue. So it's very misleading. People think that maybe this is a revenue account. Well, when you see the word unearned, automatically you think liability. We owe this to someone, a customer. 
Okay, so we are familiar with this one and this one. So we're going to be learning here in chapter 9 sales taxes uh, liability payable and also liabilities related to payroll. We've seen notes before in a couple chapters ago, but we were looking at notes not payable but notes receivable. So now we're on the other side of the note where we're borrowing the money and have to pay it back. So here's an example of giving a note payable in exchange for an account payable. So we're a matrix company and we want more time to pay off our bill, our accounts payable. So here on August 1st, we owe Carter $5,000. So instead of paying off our accounts payable right now, we give them a promissory note for 90 days for $5,000. And at the end of that 90 days, we're going to pay back the $5,000 plus interest at a rate of annual rate of 12%. So here's our journal entry. We reduce the accounts payable liability owed to Carter, reducing liability with a debit. And in its place, we give Carter a note payable of the same amount. So if you remember how to calculate the date the amount has to be paid back or collected, we um, here's 90 days. So this August 1st doesn't count. The 90 days starts on the next day, August 2nd and we know there's 31 days in August so we use up 30 days in August of this 90 see August the next month is September September has 30 days so that's 60 of the 90 so we have 30 more days September October so here's the date the money has to be paid back with interest October 30th okay so this is August 1st now let's take a look at October 30th October 30th, we're paying back the 5000 we borrowed. So here we're reducing that notes payable liability with a debit. And we also have to pay back interest. So here's the formula for interest. The principal amount being borrowed times the interest rate, the annual rate. But because we didn't borrow for a whole year, we now have to multiply it by the fraction of the year. So here's the 90 days. And it's customary um, in calculating the days of the year, not to use 365, but dividing by 360, which comes out to $150 more we have to pay. That's interest, and to us, interest expense being debited. So the total amount of cash we're paying back is cash credit 5150 Now, if you were Cotter, you would be debiting cash for 5150 you would be crediting note receivable asset reducing the asset by 5000 and instead of recording interest expense being debited you earning interest will be crediting interest revenue for 150 so you always have to know which side of the transaction are you on in the case of a note are you the borrower like we're here in chapter 9 or are you the lender as we saw back in, I believe, chapter 7. So let's say we're borrowing money this time from a bank. So the bank would not just shake your hand and say, oh yeah, pay us back later. They're going to make you sign off a lot of paperwork, including a promissory note. And even though the borrower has to sign here called the maker, it's really the bank creating this note here, the bank, American Bank of Nashville. So here's the date of the note. Again, we know this date don't count out of the 90 days um, period. We're borrowing $20,000 and we're not borrowing for free. They're charging us 6% per year. So on this date, we're going to record borrowing the money. And let's see, 90 days later, so that's uh, 30 days in uh, September. So the first date, September 1st, don't count. So we're using 29 days in September. The next month is October that has 31 days. So that's uh, 60 of the 90 days. Yeah, 60 of the 90 days. So we need 30 more days. So after October is November. So here's your due date, November 30th that you have to pay back the 20000 plus 6% over a 90-day period, for a 90-day period. 
So here's the journal entry when we borrow the money. Here's the money coming in, debit cash. And here's the promissory note liability we had signed off on, increasing liability with a the credit. Then on November 30th, 90 days later, we pay back the note, so you reduce the liability with a debit for the face value. And you also have to pay interest, and here's that formula again, principal times rate times your time. Again, time is stated in days per year, and a year is 360 days customary, coming out to $300 of interest, debiting interest expense. The bank would have interest revenue being credited, but again, you're the one paying this interest. So the total being paid, cash credit, $20,300. So one of the things we had learned way back in Chapter 3 and students um, that were surveyed say this is probably one of the most complicated areas in accounting is to record adjusting entries and adjusting entries are made at the end of your accounting period so you update all of your accounting records and when you prepare financial statements you know you're using up-to-date amounts okay so in the case of um, borrowing money you in our case here we're going to borrow eight thousand dollars on December 16th for a 60-day period but 60 days is next year but before you get to next year we're borrowing here here's the end of our year and here's when we pay off our uh, loan with interest but before the end of the year we gotta record how much interest we've accrued we've incurred even though we haven't paid it off yet the payoff is going to be here next year. We're going to have to make an adjusting entry here at the end of the year to show how much interest we earn. Okay, so first, borrowing the money on December 16th, debit cash and credit the note payable for the principal or face value. And then on December 31st, time to make our adjusting entries. And one of them is for the interest we've incurred for December 16th through the 31st. So that's. Um, Again, if you take uh, 31 days in December and minus 16, that means 15 days in December. 15 days of interest has to be recorded as your adjusting entry. So formula, principal times rate times your 15 over 360 days in a year gives you $40 of interest that you have to accrue, have to record as an adjusting entry. So you debit interest expense and you're going to credit not interest payable the interest has to be paid at the end of that uh, 60 day period was it 60? yeah 60 day period but 60 days from December 16 is next year so in the meantime here at the end of our year we owe interest interest payable liability credited for that forty dollars so now when you pay off your um, your loan let's see if I can figure out the due date Here's 15 days in December, and we have 31 in January, so that's uh, 46 days, and we have a total of 60 days. So 60 minus 46 is, um, is it 14? February 14 is our due date, February 14. On that date, you're going to pay back the $8,000 debiting the notes payable liability and you also are paying back that interest you had accrued at the end of last year of forty dollars and you have incurred interest from January 1st through February 14th which comes out to that 45 days out of the 60 days so here's again the formula to calculate the interest for the second period here in the 2012 debiting interest expense. Okay, so when you pay this $8,160 back to the bank, you have to calculate paying back three different things. The original amount of the loan, the note, $8,000, the interest that you accrued last year, forty, and the interest incurred this year for 45 days, debiting interest expense. So let's move on to another liability that we saw back in Chapter 3 called Unearned Revenue. Again, this is not a uh, revenue account. This is a liability account. 
So on May 1st, A1 Catering, we got $3,000 in advance for a wedding party that we're going to cater a couple months from now in July. So when we get the money here on May 1st, we debit cash. But because we didn't earn the money yet, we're going to be crediting not a revenue account, but a liability account unearned right away you think liability when you see that word revenue increase with a credit so eventually when we do do the work here on July 12th we're going to reduce the liability here reduce the liability with a debit and then record earning the money crediting revenue okay so don't be misled here with this revenue name here in the unearned revenue this is a liability account Increase with the credit and reduce with a debit. Okay, new topic here in Chapter 9 to calculate out sales taxes. So we have a sale by our company, Max. We sold $7,500. And the state or county charges a 6% sales tax on our customers. So we're going to collect. 6% of our sales price or $450 more. So the total being collected, debit cash, is the 7500 sales price plus the $450 uh, sales tax. So, okay, debit cash. But when we ring up the sales, the sales is not the amount you collect, but it's the uh, amount regular sales price of 7500 So the sales tax we collected is going to go eventually to the state or the county and we owe that money to the government so here's a liability account called sales taxes payable for the amount we just calculated down here now keep in mind this sales tax is not an expense you don't see debit expense here for our company max because the sales tax is really an expense of the customer we sold to and all we're doing is collecting the sales tax for the government. So we owe the government payable. So usually sales taxes are paid after the month is over. So sometime in June, we're going to pay all the sales taxes we collected in the month of May. Let me illustrate um, how this works in Hawaii. In Hawaii, we do not have a sales tax. So what are you paying? What are you paying every time you go to the store that extra four or four and a half percent or a little bit more? It's called a general excise tax. And a excise tax is charged not on the customers, but is charged to the business that's collecting the money. And in Hawaii, it's customary to pass on this tax and call it a sales tax. So let's say that you have a thousand dollar sales. In Hawaii, the regular sales tax, the retail rate is four percent. But on Oahu, because we have that uh, rail transit system that has to be paid for, they're going to tack on another half a percent uh, excise tax. So that comes out to forty-five dollars more. So the total being collected by the seller is a thousand plus the tax or a thousand forty-five dollars. So let's say that uh, it's now time to pay the tax to the government. Well, you would think the amount of tax collected here is what you pay to the government, right? But the government's going to say, "Hey, you didn't collect a thousand." You collected a thousand forty-five dollars. So what we're gonna do is charge you four and a half percent here here on Oahu, four percent on the neighbor islands. Let's see what that comes out to here. Thousand forty-five times point oh four five comes out to forty-seven dollars. I'm not gonna round two and a half cents. Okay. So you collected forty-five dollars in taxes but you're going to have to pay forty seven dollars in taxes to the government so what's really happening here is the government is taxing the tax that was collected okay so again it's customary not required to pass on this tax to the customer so what a lot of businesses do is charge not four and a half percent 
but charge I believe 4.712 uh, percent so this extra will make the company break even on the amount of tax it has to pay to the government so the amount of taxes collected now this time is forty-seven dollars and twelve cents. So the total collected from the customer is a sales price of a thousand forty-seven twelve cents. And now the government says we're going to tax all of this what you collected at that regular rate of four and a half percent. So let me double check on my calculator again. My handheld calculator, 1047.12 times 0 0.045, and I come out pretty close to the amount of tax that was collected. Okay, so I kind of break even here. So that's why that's why a lot of businesses here on uh, Oahu charge this rate here, this extra, to take into account that. They're going to be taxed not on the regular sales price but what's collected and this is really an expense of the business okay and all they're doing is passing it on making the sales price bigger to their customers okay so that's why in Hawaii we do not have a sales tax we have a general excise tax and it's only customary to pass on this tax to the customer okay so the accounting is slightly different in what our textbook is showing and what's really done here in Hawaii. Okay, sales taxes. So let's take a look at more liabilities, but this time related to to paying off our employees' payroll. So most of us are familiar with working and earning a hourly or salary, which is called gross pay. Okay, the total amount but we know this is not what you get to take home and spend because way down here is a smaller amount called net pay that you get to keep or at least to spend so in between the gross and the net is all of this stuff that's being taken out of your paycheck most of it is taxes so the common ones here called FICA tax or sometimes it's called old age let's see disability there's a s in there I think insurance um, for most of us would call this uh, social security you know when you look like you're retired and collecting although uh, social security is also paid to other people or survivors yeah survivors or dependents and something called Medicare or sometimes hospital insurance uh, Medicare part what they call a so eventually if you have to um, retire and go to a hospital they pay most of that cost versus Medicare Part B if you're collecting Social Security they would charge you Part B to cover uh, regular uh, medical costs and there's a Part uh, C and D and so forth okay? but here Medicare costs for hospital old age survivor disability benefits are taken out of your paycheck so some people pay more of these taxes, sometimes called FICA, Social Security taxes, than income taxes, both federal and state. Some states don't have income taxes like Texas, Florida, Nevada. Yeah, A lot of people like to move to those states and not pay any state income taxes. But in Hawaii we have this and this. Okay, so there's a formula to learn how to take out these taxes and we learn basically just this one here. So income taxes probably will be given to us. Now if you want to learn more about payroll taxes and that Hawaii general excise tax, I would recommend you taking our accounting class called Accounting 132, Payroll Accounting and Hawaii General Excise Tax. So what we learn in just a few pages in our Chapter 9, Accounting 132 students would spend the whole semester. Oh, another withholding they take off from your gross pay is what they call volunteer deductions like um, pension contributions, health insurance, maybe even union dues. All reducing your gross pay, leaving a smaller net pay. And your job as our student accountants is to journalize and calculate these amounts. So in the case of the Social Security or FICA taxes, the rule is, here's an old rule for 2010. 
there's a maximum amount employees can earn, an employee can earn during the year, and all of it will be subject to the Social Security tax or FICA tax here at a rate of 6.2. Keeping in mind, 6.2 is only half of the Social Security tax taken out from the employee's pay. The other half has to be matched by the employer. So the total Social Security or FICA tax is really 12.4% half paid by the employee taken out from their pay and another half paid by the employer matching this uh, additional 6.2. The um, Medicare insurance, there's no dollar limit for wages or salaries during the year per employee. All of the wages an employee earns is subject to this 1.45 percent rate and again this is just the employee share and the employer has to, mat employer has to match it. Okay, and then income taxes are withheld, both federal and state. Typically when you start a job, or every so often your employer is going to ask you to fill out a form called a W-4, where you write in your name, address, social security number, your marital status, and something called withholding allowances you claim. The more withholding allowances you claim, the less income taxes they take out from your paycheck. A lot of people think withholding allowances are based upon the amount of people being claimed on your income tax form, income tax return. That's true, but also if you have uh, tax deductions and tax credits, you can claim more withholding allowances. Again, the more you claim, the less taxes they take out. Although you, that may cause you to owe when you file your tax return and get a smaller refund. And more things being taken out, again, union dues. I wouldn't say savings account uh, deductions or reductions, withholdings. This is really a part of your net pay. Uh, pension contributions, you may be asked to contribute to a pension or profit sharing plan, a 401k plan. You may be paying for part of your health insurance or disability insurance or contributing to United Way or here in uh, Hawaii we call it Aloha United Way or if you're a federal worker there's something called combined federal campaign again charities c contributions taken off your paycheck so journalizing the debits and credits so here is the total gross pay being debited could be one or all of your employees for this pay period here ending January 31st, debiting salary or wage expense. Okay, so we know expenses regarded with debits. But take a look at the ending of all of these other accounts being credited. Every one of these are what type? We know when we see the word payable, we're dealing with a liability, and liabilities are increased with credits. So these right here are the withholdings being taken out from your gross pay. And the leftover here at the very bottom is the net pay, here called a crude salary or crude wages payable. So the employee is going to see this in their paycheck. And all of this is being taken out. So we've seen the calculation for Social Security and Medicare costs. Again, this is just half of the Social Security costs, the FICA taxes. And then the other uh, taxes, federal, state income taxes, health insurance, union dues, all being taken out. So the employer is withholding this and eventually the employer is going to pay this to the federal government, to the federal government, to the insurance company, to the union for the employee, and eventually pay this to the employee as their net take-home pay. So more costs now to the employer. So in addition to, let me go back to the previous screen, in addition to incurring this cost to pay the employee for the gross pay, the employer also has to incur, again, the other half of the FICA, Social Security, and Medicare tax, and also the employer has to pay unemployment taxes. So when the employee may be laid off, they can go ahead and file for unemployment insurance, or unemployment compensation, unemployment pay. And it's the employers, the businesses, that fund this amount, paying both the federal and the state. So here's an example. We have uh, wages. Here it says up to 7,000 wages, probably higher, more like eight or 9,000. 
in the current year subject each employee pay subject to this unemployment federal tax and for state they use the same maximum wages per employee but in Hawaii it's probably closer to forty thousand dollars and the rate they're using for state is 5.4 really it can vary maybe as low as two or as high as six depending upon the experience rating of the employer in other words if the employer has a lot of former employees filing for unemployment pay then the rate will go up or if a lot of um, there's not been a lot of claims by uh, past employees of an employer the rate will go down in any case what the uh, federal rate is going to be is not the 6.2 but 6.2 minus what the um, uh, state rate is or in this case the federal unemployment tax rate will be just 0.8 percent okay 5.4 for state and 0.8 percent for 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 federal so if you apply this to the let's say 4,000 of uh, wages we saw before 5.4 for state uh, unemployment tax here they call it SUTA state unemployment tax act act means just law FUTA federal unemployment tax notice this is the 0.8 percent being used here okay. so now recording the employers taxes you have to pay for the same 4,000 of payroll gross pay here's the matching amount remember we saw this before this is not duplicating it's doubling the here's the employees share of the FICA taxes and now you double it here's the employer share for the same amounts and now also the unemployment taxes state and federal like we calculated over here again notice all the names payable increasing liabilities we owe the government now you have to add up all of these amounts then you get this total that we debit to payroll taxes expense so when you hire employees as a business you don't just look at the gross pay you have to pay the employees as the total cost you have to look at additional benefits in fact we haven't even considered uh, retirement benefits vacation benefits sick leave anything else you give your employees besides even supplies office space the rent equipment employees are expensive okay so more liabilities maybe you don't know the actual amount but if you know it's due if you know you have to pay for it you're gonna have to try to estimate the amount and record it so some examples of uh, these estimated costs may be retirement benefits you have to fund have to pay for so here looks like we're paying for medical insurance uh, crediting the liability we owe and eventually also retirement benefits crediting the liability we owe adding up these amounts and debiting I would probably want to have a more um, specific account name like medical insurance or retirement expense here here they're grouping it all together under an account called employee benefits expense so vacation pay let's say you get two weeks of vacation so your annual salary here comes out to a weekly salary of a thousand two hundred dollars by keeping in mind you're not going to work all 52 weeks because you're going to be given two weeks of vacation so really you're working only 50 weeks earning that annual salary so those two weeks are really the vacation pay being paid so taking the difference here comes out to a vacation pay or benefit of forty eight dollars so every pay period you're gonna record this salary expense debit but then also at the same time every pay period you're gonna record forty eight dollars of vacation expense debit and eventually when you're gonna take the vacation here you are accruing a vacation pay benefit payable so eventually when the employee does take the vacation you're gonna not gonna be debiting salary expense but you're gonna be using up this um, payable paying off this payable that you've been accruing because again we record expenses not at the time you pay it when they take vacation but during those 50 weeks that they work that you they earn it another potential expense uh, we're taking to account is cost of 
warranties. So one of the rules we had learned in past chapters was to match up revenue and record it with the related expenses in the same period. But in the case of warranties, you may be paying for a cost in future years for things you sold in past years. So what you gotta do is estimate how much expense you're gonna incur in future years for the current revenue. The example here is to sell a car here for the cost of 32000 and past experience has shown that uh, warranty cost has been 3% of the revenue. So when we record the revenue, at the same time, you got to record a warranty expense here, 3% of the 32000 debiting expense. Again, in the same year, same period as the related revenue was recorded. But because you haven't paid it yet, you're putting that cost into a liability account, a warranty liability. So later on when the customer comes in to get their item fixed on the warranty, here's the cost being used up, taking out inventory, paying employees, or incurring la uh, labor costs. What you're going to debit is not an expense that was already done back here in last year. What you're using up is this liability that you accrued so you can match up the expense with the related revenue for the same period and not record the expense later on in the following year. Contingent liabilities. Okay, the question is maybe you owe the money. If it's probable you're going to have to pay and you can estimate the amount, that means you got to record the liability. Debit the cost, account, expense, or loss, and crediting the liability. But if you cannot estimate the amount, you still have to tell the users of your financial statement, disclose to them that you probably are going to owe something, but you're not going to debit and credit or record the, the transaction here. Or if the uh, amount is possible but not likely, then you're going to still have to disclose on your financial statement here the amount, possible amount or maybe you cannot determine the amount, but you have to say you may owe the amount. So typical situations here are maybe lawsuits. So you would ask the attorney, well, can you tell me if we're going to lose any lawsuits and the amount? You don't want to have to admit to it on the financial statement, but if it's probable and you can estimate the amount, then you got to record it. But if you know you're going to lose but cannot figure out the amount, then you have to disclose. Or if you're not too sure but you think maybe you're gonna owe money, then you have to disclose. Now it's if it's unlikely, remote, that you're gonna owe money, even if you're sued and it's remote, you know, there's so much lawsuits, yeah, then you don't have to do anything here. Okay. Again, potential liabilities usually come with uh, lawsuits. Or if you have to guarantee loans of other people. At the end of our chapter, we have financial ratios, and here is an example that bankers like to see how many times the company has earned the amount of interest that has to be paid off on their loans. So if you remember on our income statement, we have revenue minus expenses to equal our company's net income or net profit. Included in this expense would be interest um, deductions and taxes, and here's the leftover money, right? Well, what we do is take that net income, this net income, and we back out the interest and back out the uh, taxes, and that leaves a bigger profit that can be used to help you pay off interest. Okay, so that's this figure up here. And here is the interest amount for the year. And if you divide that into this money before any interest and taxes that the company has uh, earned, and paying off other expenses. That's going to give you a figure of how many times the interest was can be paid off during the year. And as a banker, you want to see your clients have a high interest earned. That means they're good creditors, uh, people to lend to. And if it's low, that means they're kind of risky and you're not going to maybe lend them any money or lend them less money or charge them a higher rate because they're a bad risk. Okay, that's times interest earned calculation. So that's the end of our chapter. Make sure you work on your learn smart and your homework assignments. 
make sure you do it before the Sunday deadline. Okay, talk to you later.